morning, everybody. Let's try it one more time. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, good. We're gonna we can have more light on the side. I need to be able to see people's faces. We may need to flip on the lights in the back uh, if I can't. Oh, that's that's not too bad. Okay, we're gonna start with a little audience participation this morning. All right. Uh, oh, I know it's terrible. Um, but uh, hopefully this will be fun and, and you'll you'll be okay with it. So here's a question. I want you to make sure you hear the question before you answer. It's a very important question. Probably a question that has had radical impact on your life, much like it has mine. How many of you have ever had a Krispy Kreme donut? Okay, a few of you, okay. Now, almost as equally a question, second only to you believing in Jesus, how many of you have never had a Krispy Kreme donut? A few of you? Raise them, raise them high. Raise them high. Don't be scared. Trevor, you've, ne you've never had a Krispy Kreme donut. How do you live with yourself? <laughs> um, Trevor will be transferring to Mac this afternoon. <laughs> I'm kidding. Trevor, come on up. I want, I want Trevor to come up for a second. Come on up, Trevor. Come on up on stage. Up on stage, go ahead and climb up on stage. My notes are up there, just go ahead and keep going. There's a mic there, you just keep preaching. I'm just, I'm, you gotta turn the mic on, Trevor. Rule number one of preaching, they've gotta hear you. Okay, I'm teasing. Now, I have here, and now, yeah. All of a sudden, we've got converts. Okay, so I have Krispy Kreme donuts, Trevor. I'm going to let you hold this, okay? Krispy Kreme donuts, because I don't mess around, all right? I don't eat those half-hearted donuts. I eat Krispy Kreme. The chair's for me. <clears throat> so, Trevor, you've never had a Krispy Kreme donut, honestly? Honestly. Never? Hold it. Oh, my. Yes. Let me try this one more time. He's on. You, can you hear him? Hello? All right. All right. You've never had a Krispy Kreme donut. Okay. Come a little closer. It's okay. <laughs> Is this weird yet? I don't know if I can answer that honestly. Okay. All right. All right. So what I want you to do, Trevor, here's a Krispy Kreme donut. All right. And it's a reminder that we all have a God-shaped hole in all of us. That's terrible, isn't it? It's pretty bad. It's cheesy. Not the donut, but the, the phrase. <laughs> what I want you to do now, Trevor, is I want you to explain to me why this is the most beautiful and delicious donut that I've ever eaten. I want you to explain to them what I'm experiencing right now. <laughs> Thinking a little happiness. Mm -hmm. How does it taste in my mouth? I have no idea. <laughs> it's just, you know, you've, you've had donuts before, right? Yes. How is this one different? I haven't tried that one yet. <laughs> and you're not. <laughs> so, you, what you're telling me is that you do not know what this donut tastes like. It looks glazed. It says glazed. Oh, that makes more sense. No, okay. All right. So if you can say that based on your experience with the Krispy Kreme donut, that you're pretty clueless. Pretty much. Okay. Because, I just spit on you, sorry. <laughs> because you've never had a Krispy Kreme donut. Yep. You've never experienced it. Yep. Do you have a girlfriend? Yes. And she it's knows this about you. <laughs> oh, she just found out. Okay. I'm going to give this box to you against my better judgment. Thank you. Warm it up for eight seconds in the microwave. All right. Eight seconds. <laughs> Not nine. All right. Okay? Go make your girl proud. All right. All right. <laughs> 
Now, Trevor, there are 11 of those left. You can get more than one girl. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Nobody's that crazy. Okay. So, sorry. That was really good. Now, what I, the, the point of that is sometimes we approach Scripture this way. Trevor, he can't legitimately explain to me the, the taste, the experience of having a Krispy Kreme donut. I mean, it's ridiculous for me to suggest that even. I mean, sorry, I'm talking about my mouth full. It's a, it's a dumb thing to suggest even. Trevor, tell me what a Krispy Kreme donut is like if you've never had one before. Explain to me what I'm experiencing as I'm sitting down in the chair. You can't do that. It's impossible to do that. But yet, oftentimes, we approach Scripture, reading the Bible. We, 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 we approach the Bible that way. We try to explain it. We try to understand it. We try to maybe even describe it. Maybe even enjoy it without ever having experienced it for ourselves. What's worse, perhaps, is if I were to give Trevor the Krispy Kreme donuts and I were to eat them and then just try to explain to him the Krispy Kreme donut and what it tastes like and the experience of having it and how it's majestically awesome and all that kind of stuff, and him never eating it himself, me just trying to explain it to him, as if that was going to be adequate enough for him to have a full experience with the Krispy Kreme donut, which is necessary for salvation. But we approach the Bible this way sometimes. We pretend like we know it, we act like we know it, we try to live it out based on the experiences of other people, what other people may have told us, um, maybe even looking at it or maybe even attending church or chapel, but never really truly experiencing it and getting into the Bible itself. Now, the, the real difficulty with that, in my opinion, is that you are relying entirely on other people or other sources to explain to you things that are critical to our develop, development spiritually. I mean this quite literally, that heaven and hell hang in the balance whenever we choose to follow man and what man says or describes for us, rather than what God's word in the Bible says because men get it goofed up all the time now there's there's a little bit more audience participation i want you to do and take your quiz go ahead even if you're on the digital detox it's okay get your cell phones out we're going to take a, a a little quiz five questions is all not that difficult all right five questions um justin has them um coming up here you need to make sure that when you like where you put the phone number you're going to put two two three 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 that's how you're going to get through to to us that's how you're going to be able to vote 22333, three, three. and the question, you have to, then you have to enter in, not true, but the number for true and the number for false. So the first question is, Adam and Eve were cast out of Eden because they ate the apple that was forbidden. True or false? True is 151630, Three people have voted so far. Good job. Okay. All right. Keep it up. We'll see how we do. Adam and Eve were cast out of Eden because they ate the apple that was forbidden. Okay. All right. That's probably enough. Now, some of you said true, obviously. Some of you said false. The answer is actually false. There's nowhere in the Bible that it says that Adam and Eve ate, even ate an apple. In fact, in South Africa, they believed that the forbidden fruit was a banana. Did you know that? Nowhere does it say that it was an apple. Yet we have believed that, we've been told that, we've been described that down through the ages that, you know, they ate an apple. And they, it probably is a reflection of, you know, the apple kind of being a, a some symbolism of, of America. It's very common here. Um, but we've kind of read that into scripture. It's not really there. Let's go ahead to the next question. The next question, I'm going to read it. Well, this is getting ready. In the Bible, Jesus feeds 4,000 people at once. True or false? Same deal. In the Bible, 
Jesus feeds 4,000 people at once. There's your code. Code's the same. True, false. In the Bible, Jesus feeds 4,000 people at once. Go ahead and vote. True or false? We'll see if our participation continues to be as good as it was. All right. So, 17 said that it's true, 24 false. That is actually a true statement. Jesus did feed 4,000 people. There are two stories in the Bible, one where Jesus feeds 4,000 people in one instance, and then a different story altogether where Jesus feeds 5,000 people. So there are two stories. Jesus fed 4,000 people one time, and then another time he fed 5,000. That's a true statement. But yet again, some of us never have been told that that first story about the 4,000, because the one that we talk about the most is the feeding of the 5,000. So let's go ahead and go to the next question. The next question, the Bible says that God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> the Bible says that God helps those who help themselves. Again, here's our, our true, is it working? I don't really have that <laughs> The Bible says that cleanliness is next to godliness. Is that true or false? Justin just randomly puts questions up there. I have no idea what's coming next, apparently. Okay, so some of you say yes, some of you say no. I've, that's actually not in the Bible. That's a quote by John Wesley. But yet again, we have heard that statement so many times that we think that it's in the Bible. And we have attributed something that is maybe a good thing, but we've attributed it to the Bible, and the Bible doesn't say that at all. I'm anxious to see what the next question is. <laughs> Slavery was an acceptable practice in the Bible. True or false? Okay, most of you say true. That's actually a trick question. It's both true and false. Sorry, that wasn't a third option, I know. There are three different kinds of forms of slavery in the Bible, two of which were acceptable, one of which was not. The one that was, was not was the one that exploited people and abused them. The first two were ones where people chose to become slaves, and they were, they were, there were term limits on it, and they were set free. It was very much a practice that the person bestowed upon themselves that they were going to enter into a, a slavery situation, and then they would be a, there was a term limit, and they would get out of it. Okay, here's the last question. Okay, you guys are doing great. The proverb, this dog won't hunt, is found in the Bible. This dog won't hunt. It's found in the Bible. <laughs> Madeline says no. <laughs> All right. Actually, that's true. I'm kidding. It's not true. <laughs> no. Only in Tennessee. <laughs> This is actually a question that came from a, a, a theolo theologian at uh, Tennessee State University. He had an argument with the, one of his classmates who was adamant that the Bible said in Proverbs, this dog won't hunt. My point is, and, and it's, I'm trying to be a little silly with it, is that some of us knew those answers, others weren't so sure. Um, the last one I mentioned was taken from that theologian, and, and it's kind of cute and funny. Um, and I don't do this to make us feel bad that some of us know the scriptures better than others. I'm sure some of you voted incorrectly, some of you voted correctly. But my point is that we don't know what the Bible says. Perhaps even worse, we sometimes think that it says things that it really doesn't. In fact, Sydney, Sydney White Craw Crawford writes, We often infect the Bible with our own values and morals, not asking what the Bible's values are. 
and what their morals really are. Think about that for a second. Now, those were just samples. But there are lots of things that we put into the Bible. We, we, we look to the Bible to validate our own beliefs. Or we look to the Bible to validate our own morals. Rather than looking to the Bible to see what values and morals we should have. And we see this happen all the time, don't we? Usually it comes in the phrase of something, well, I just really feel like God wouldn't. Or I just really feel like God would. Or I really feel like God would tell me to. And sometimes those are in complete contradiction for what Scripture really says, what the Bible really says. My point is we have to know what the Bible says. If we're ever going to get through the realities of the difficult times in our life, understand who we are as believers and what we're to be about. So what does the Bible say about things like lying or sex? What does the Bible say about pornography? What does it say about money or gossip? What does it say about homosexuality, treatment of others, marriage, and dating? These things and a host of other things, topics that are relevant and critical to our lives, are found right in the Bible, yet we never bother to try to find out for ourselves. We're content to sit in the chair, eat a Krispy Kreme donut, and have somebody else explain it to us or evaluate what we believe the Krispy Kreme donut really is about rather than really looking into it. That's a problem, right? That's a problem. I mean, think about it in terms like this. If you are an athlete or a musician and you never had a piece of music set before you and you never received any instruction and you've never looked in, over the music or, or, or you've never sat down and read through the plays or studied film or done anything of, of that nature, how many of us would really be able to participate in those activities and actually do well? Very few of us. That's why Major League Baseball players, in between at-bats, go down into the dugout and you see them kind of trail off. They're not going to get more sunflower seeds. They're going to watch film, to study, to see what happened on that particular at-bat. What was the pitcher throwing? What was their arm slot like? What was, you know, when, when they were hitters, did they get their hands through the zone? Did they buckle? What did they do? That's what they're, they're, they're looking for that. But yet many of us will just go kind of through life and fall down. Sometimes we'll fail. Sometimes we'll be challenged and we'll succeed. Sometimes we'll be challenged and we'll fail without ever stopping to really study what it is that the Bible has in store for us and wants for us. And then we wonder why things don't turn out in our faith like we had hoped. You see, we read scripture. And go ahead and with the next one. I don't know if I should continue to do this, Justin, or not. We, oh, I should have left it alone. Are we doing this at the same time? <laughs> All the 13-year-old boys just woke up. <laughs> okay. What are we doing? What's the next one? What does it say? Justin, you do it. I'm not touching this again. Okay. We read scripture because we take on the nature of its contents. When we allow God's word to be daily read and daily lived, this is great. We begin to take on the very character, characteristics of God. When we read the Bible, we live the Bible daily in our lives, we begin to take on the characteristics of Almighty God. Isn't that what we're kind of striving for, if we're, we're believers in Jesus Christ? To take on the very characteristics of Almighty God. When we daily investigate God's word, we daily get into it, we begin to see God's characteristics come into our life. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 16, it says this, it'll be on the screen, about being holy. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed that is coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. God has called each and every one of us to lives of holiness. 
How are we possibly going to live lives of holiness if we don't know what the Bible says? Because the Bible and what the Bible says is an instruction guide for how his people are to live out lives of holiness. And it's not one of those things that you can do once a month or just on Sundays when you go to church. Because there's something missing there. There's an interaction missing there. There's something different psychologically that happens in your mind when you read something. It adheres to a different part of your brain. When you memorize scripture, it adheres to a different part of who you are. And you're able to live it out and you take on the characteristics of God. So how do we do that? How do we take on the characteristics of God? Well, I've already started to kind of touch on this a little bit. But in Romans chapter 12, one of my, my favorite Sections of scripture begins to tell us how we have ourselves changed and transformed to take on the characteristics of God. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Did you hear that? Do not conform to the pattern of this world, the way that everybody else lives. You're not to live like that. But be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We take on the characteristics of God. We take on the characteristics of his son, Jesus, by renewing our minds. Here's why it's important for us to renew our minds. In the book of James, it says that when sin is conceived, it is first conceived in the mind. When it's conceived in the mind... It travels into our hearts, our very souls, the very fabric of who we are. And then when it has taken root, it produces out in our lives sin. We have to guard what we put in our minds. We have to allow our minds to be transformed by God's word written in the Bible. So that that is what's planted in our hearts. And so that that is what comes out in our everyday coming and going lives. I love the way the message paraphrases this in Romans chapter 12, and it's on the screen as well. We're going to fly through this one, but I love the way that it, it describes this because I think it's an easier way for us to understand what it means to allow ourselves to be transformed, to have our minds and our lives transformed. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. If you have your own Bible, I'd underline that if you have the message. God helping you because on our own we can't do it. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. I wonder sometimes how many of us can tell the difference, somebody could tell the difference between somebody who's worldly and somebody who's a believer among us? It's a good question. Can people tell the difference? Instead, fixing your attention on God, you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture, culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you. Develops well-formed maturity in you. The author of Romans challenges us to take the small things, our everyday coming and going lives. You going to class, interacting with your roommate, interacting with your sweet mates, your teammates, the people in the cafeteria, the way that you study, the way that you interact with your girlfriend or your boyfriend and who you choose to have as a girlfriend or boyfriend. How you are every day coming and going simple lives and gently Bring it to God. And through our interactions with his word in the Bible, allowing our minds to be transformed so our perspective on things, on those things, and many, many other things are changed into the perspective that God would have for us. All right, we've got to fly through this next series of things. So here's some tips on studying scripture. Number one, read it. Now, this is really, really complicated, so I'm going to explain it to you. Read it. 
you just take the Bible. I would encourage you to start maybe in Mark or maybe a Proverbs, in Proverbs or Psalms. James is another good one. I like James. And just sit down and start reading it. There's no rush. You don't have to get through a whole chapter. Read more than a verse. Read a section at least. Read it. Very simple. Number two, read it with understanding. Read it with understanding. Meditation. How does it affect me? How does it change me? Read it with understanding. I'm trying to understand what this text is meaning. Reading the Bible was never intended. This is from... Um, Celebration of discipline. Reading the Bible was never intended to be the primary means of absorbing the Bible. Reading is the exposure to Scripture, and that's the starting place. Read it. Meditation, however, is the absorption of Scripture, and that, that is what leads to the experiences with God and the changes in our lives we seek when we come to the Bible. Read it, and then read it with understanding. Number three. Read it with context. That's larger sections. Not just a short section, but maybe two or three chapters at a time. Or an entire book if it's small. Asking questions like, where does this text fit into the larger story of the Bible? Or the book itself? How does it fit within the broader motif of Scripture? That's the motif as a theme. How does it fit within the broader theme of Scripture? It is important to read several sections at a time. For example, you can read a section or a chapter each day and at the end of the week review all of those chapters together and see it as one big story, which oftentimes is what it is. Does one section refer to another? Does, it un does understanding one section help to explain the other section? Read it with context. Four, read it with interpretation. Interpretation of who God is and who we are as his people. What is the author trying to say, what is his message, the author's message? Now, here's a hint. You must understand the context if you're going to be able to interpret. What is the author trying to communicate to the audience who is reading this? If number three is, better, is a better understanding of what is going, number four is a better understanding of why it was worth mentioning at all. What do other people say about it? What are the hidden meanings of what were the intentions and words that were being used. I'll give you a real fast example, and then I've got to wrap up. A real fast example, the story of Jesus turning water into wine. Great story, right? Jesus' first miracle, keep the party going. I'm sorry? I didn't catch that. Not as courageous the second time. So Jesus turning water into wine. He takes that water, and the story in and of itself just looks like, hey, great, he's turned water into wine. Maybe he felt a little pressure from his mom. But as you unpack that text, you begin to understand that the turning water into wine was significant because it was a symbolism. The, the, the water was transformed in Jewish purification vessels, which was an indication that Jesus now contained or had the authority and the power to purify it happened at a wedding. You understand that, that in our culture, it's not that big of a deal. But in that culture, when, when, when a wedding ran out of gifts and trinkets and food and drink, that it was terribly embarrassing and in some cases even punishable by law. We read it with interpretation. There's more to the story oftentimes. Jesus was fulfilling what the law was that we would be saved and purified through him. So we read scripture, and it's important to read scripture. Direction in our life, departure from sinful living happens when we read scripture. Maturity begins to develop in our lives. Strength of our faith, hope, wisdom, salvation, all these things. Now I skipped ahead, Justin. I want to go to the last slide. and want to read John chapter 10, verse 1 through 6 as we close. And as we close, um, we have some handouts. This is from uh, Cross Point Church. Um, this is, approaches it slightly different than what, uh, what I have, but there's some similarities, and I encourage you to grab one on your way out. They're going to be passed out, um, just helping you to understand a little bit more and getting started with reading Scripture. But here's why I think it's important for us to read Scripture from John chapter 10, verse 1 through 6. 
Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. And the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Now that dog will hunt. <laughs> to follow God, you've got to know his voice. The only way we know his voice is by getting into his word as we read the Bible. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to engage in your word. I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't just... Um, experience what other people experience or listen to what other people say, but we would be transformed by our own experience in the word through reading the Bible. Please help us to do that. In Christ's name, amen. Preview students, if you'd stay here, the rest of you are dismissed. Lord bless you.